gather in the name of the one true and living God on this uh, second Sunday in Lent. I welcome everyone to church this morning, reminding everyone that whether we are a child or a senior citizen or somewhere in between, that we are welcome. Whatever our families look like, whatever the color of our skin may be, our sexual orientation, our gender identities, whatever money we have or do not have, know that we are welcome in this place because in and through Jesus Christ, we believe that we all stand on equal ground, loved by God, welcomed by God's holy and grace. We begin our service now with a time of silence and invite you to remain seated throughout our time of the confession.
Gracious God, on this beautiful morning, we are reminded that you have made us in such a way that we cannot live just by bread alone, but by every living word that comes from you to us. So give us a hunger this morning for your living word. The word that will come to us as the scriptures are read and proclaimed, the word that will speak to us your message of grace as we gather at the table, that we may go forth satisfied, filled, nourished, to do your work in the world you so love. All this we pray through Jesus Christ, he who reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, you are one eternal triune God now and forevermore. Amen. Thanks. Today comes from the book of Numbers, chapter 21, verses 4 through 9. I uh, can found on the key Bible of the King, that's in page 139. From Mount Thor they set out by the way to the Red Sea, to go around the land of Leon, but the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent, and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it upon a pole, and whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. where it will, 
And you can hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can this be? And Jesus said to him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and you do not understand these things? Truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know, we testify to what we have seen, and yet you do not receive our testimony. If I told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe it if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so too must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in Him will have life eternal. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, so that everyone who believes in Him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is the gospel of Christ. It is our good news. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now my, my last power and the spirit that is present here with us, may my words become God's living word in your ears and heart and mind. I will bet my life, and I mean that, that I am not the only person in this room right now who is creeped out by snakes. Show of hands. We had some, well, we actually had a lot of snakes back home in Indiana where we lived, and none of them were poisonous, at least not where we lived in Indiana. They were not like the fiery serpents in the Bible. I will say this, if there is such a thing as snake homicide karma, I am doomed because I have a lot of it. I killed a lot of snakes, not by choice, but by accident under lawnmower blades and wheels and such. So I guess that makes a second degree snake slaughter maybe a lot of Whenever I met up with a snake on foot, however, I would stop dead in my tracks, and then both of us would run for our lives. My dad told me over and over again that our snakes could not hurt me. And he suggested that if I would just stand still and look at one right in the eyes, that I might just overcome some of my fear. So I did, and it helped. But Dad's eyeball to eyeball snake cure really never took. Still hasn't. I do not like snakes. My grandmother made it worse. <clears throat> she grew up south of Lexington, Kentucky, and they had some bad boys down there, copperheads and rattlesnakes and such. She used to regale us with her snake battle stories. She met up with one in the hen house. This was the closest that she ever came to being bitten. It was down inside a little nest, gorging on an egg that she was sent to collect. She threw her egg basket at it, and then she ran like crazy, whereupon her mother, my great grandmother Clark, hauled on her big snake boots, grabbed her snake hoe, and marched off to do battle. The snake left the hen house without its hissing head. Grandma said that her mother's ferociousness with snakes had everything to do with the Bible and all the things reported in the Bible as regards snakes, especially their chief purpose being the tormenting of females. That's in Genesis chapter 3 for all of you who don't know the Bibles. It's there. Which causes me to wonder if my ultra-fundamentalist 
great grandmother or my grandmother for that matter ever bothered to read a little further in the Bible. The book of Numbers, chapter 21, the piece that Abraham read for us, and then paid attention to the curious things that Jesus said about it in John chapter 3. It's all there. According to Jesus, Numbers 21 has some important things to say to us, not so much about snakes, but about him. In the interest of time, I'm going to give you the Cliff Notes version of the story. Somewhere between their escape from Pharaoh of Egypt and the promised land 40 years later, the wandering Israelites had got very grumpy and snarky. They thought the trip should have been a lot shorter. They were sick of the food. They were tired of living in campgrounds. And some of them started to say out loud what everybody else just thought about behind closed doors. And it was this. Maybe Moses was making up of all those stories. Maybe Moses wasn't really off talking to God on not after all. I mean, did God really hand off all those bizarre directions and protocol for worship and sacrifices and priests and whatnot. All those picky rules and commandments. Did the old duffer really know what he was doing? Next thing you know, the Israelites moved camp into a place called Edom, which also happened to be home to poisonous fiery serpents. And the meaning they made out of their misfortune was that the serpents were slithering, biting instruments of divine punishment because of their bad mouth, bad mouth in God's prophet, poor old Moses. Now, after they heartily apologized, they asked Moses to please go off on another one of your trips, go have one of your face-to-face -face meetings, and convince the Lord to call off the snakes. They had been punished enough. And so Moses headed for the hills, and he pleaded on their behalf, and he came back with bad news and good news. Bad news, the snakes were going to stay put. Good news, God gave him yet another one of his holy protocols, this time for snake bite. Now listen up. He made a big bronze serpent. He fastened it to a tall pole and stuck it in the ground. And he told the people that God had told him that if when they are bitten, they need to haul themselves or have someone hold them there and sit underneath that pole and keep their eyeballs on the snake. It's all there. If they were truly earnest and repentant, if they really meant business with God, they would be in a world of hurt. But they would live to tell the story. Sit with that man, and you might start to see just how profound it is. The very thing that had given them so much pain and fear and death was religiously transformed into a sign and symbol of healing and mercy. Telling them that life would go on, but in a new way. And here's something else. The Israelites were not the only ancient culture 
with a serpent totem or a snake cultic symbol. All of you students of history know that the Greek god of healing used a pole with a serpent wrapped around it as a magical healing wand. By the way, that's where the American Medical Association got that repulsive logo of two snakes wrapped around a cross-like pole. It's taken from that story. Medical researchers and psychologists, they say that those old snake totems those old symbols operated on the placebo effect of hope and trust, which is probably a hundred times more powerful than any of us want to believe, and the doctors in our midst will tell you so. And some of you are looking at me like, well, Jim, that's all very interesting, but what in the world does it have to do with church or me? or limits of Jesus or the cross. Well, <clears throat> according to Jesus, everything. Because Jesus compared himself to that bronze serpent wrapped around the pole, that snake that pulled so many sick Israelites back from death through all their pain and their misery, Long before Jesus ended up nailed to a Roman pole, he told this very devout man named Nicodemus that his mission was to become a new serpent on a pole who would pull his people through fiery trials and destruction all the way to life after death after life in the new world with a new body that they usually call the age to come. He would do all of that by way of a pole being lifted up. But it all turned on trust, which unfortunately our New Testament English Bibles almost always translate belief as in intellectual believing all the right things. It's really a bad translation. Jesus told Nicodemus that he was the good and noble son of man, not the victorious son of God, the son of man, God's beloved one, who according to Daniel and Isaiah would become the pathway of vision that would save the people's souls and maybe even their mortal bodies if they truly trusted and followed his way. He would accomplish the same thing as the bronze serpent in the wilderness, even if it meant his body being lifted up on a pole. And those who keep their eyeballs on it will experience the unconditional love and grace and the kindness of God. And of course, we know that that actually happened. Jesus saw it coming. Paul uses the same ancient story, the same image, the same metaphor all over his letters, reminding the believers that they have been lifted up to a new life with Jesus through his suffering death, his life, his resurrection. Now, this might land as very, very good news in your ears if you, like me, just have never really been able to get your heart or your head around a God who requires blood and bodily death as exchange, you know, for mercy and fullness of life here and in the world to come. The whole blood sacrifice image. Now make no mistake about it, you can find plenty of those Bible verses 
to make that case. But friends, John 3.16 is not one of them. Never has been. And Jesus, who himself was lifted up on a Roman pole, said so. Which for me, makes that Bible verse that I memorized as a kid even more wonderful. 50 plus years later. Now I cannot explain every mystery to you. And I will not try to destroy anyone's theology if that's what is saving your life. But it never saved mine. But I can tell you what has been saving my life all these years. And it's this. Keeping my eyeballs on Jesus. On the things he said and did. On the pathway he walked and called us to follow. Why? Because God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever trusts in him will not perish, but have life everlasting. For God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save.
roll down like mighty waters. Gracious God, you have called the church, your faithful ones in Jesus Christ, to help you do this. So we ask by your power to keep us in faith, with deep trust and hope, so that we might join the risen Christ serving the world. God sends peace to the earth. Put down greed and pride, anger and vengeance. God, we pray especially for leaders around the world who have so much to offer, so much power in their hands and offices to help this world change. So we ask that you would put down vain glory inside them and help them to seek the common good. Especially, O oh Lord, we continue to pray for those in Ukraine, Ukraine whose nation has been invaded by a foreign power. Give them strength, O oh God, and perseverance, hope, and trust. Gracious God, we also pray for needs present in our own community. We pray for our cities. We pray for those who are unemployed and underemployed, for the homeless, the poor, the hurting, the suffering. That help us to be a part of that transformation. And we also pray for those we know and love. We pray for those who are recovering, and those whose lives are transitioning. We pray for those who have lost loved ones. Especially today, we lift before you Jane and Laurel, Dennis and Linda, Anita, Grace, Barbara, Jim, and Lynn. We remember Sue and Georgiana. And say we remember Linda and Larry and others who are grieving the loss of their loved ones. God of all comfort, help us to be ministers of comfort and consolation. Lord God, we trust in your living word, the word we hear in the life, the teachings, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. Your spirit enables us to live and pray and serve. And we ask that you would accept these our requests and our thanksgivings. That all things will work together for those who love and serve you with all their heart and mind and strength. All this we pray through Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Beloved in Christ, let us remember the words of Jesus. He who said, Behold, I stand at your door, and I knock. If you will hear my voice and open the door, I will come into you and eat with you and you with me. And let us indeed remember that all the children, whosoever, are invited to God.
God's feast because the table is ready for the greatest and the least among us. You may be seated. The Lord will be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and a great joy of God to come inside these walls to gather with friends in Christ and worship and praise your name and hear a living word. Lord, remember that it is in your wisdom that you made all things and that you continue to sustain this universe by your power. God, you formed us in your image and called us to love and serve you and others. And God, we thank you that throughout these days, even when we were slaves in Egypt, that you freed. You continue to love us and free us, to feed us in the wilderness and to save us from the poison of sin. God, you spoke through prophets, calling us to turn from our own willful ways back to your way. And we are grateful that in the fullness of time, you sent Jesus among us to be one of us, to save us from ourselves. Therefore, we praise you, O God, joining our voices with choirs of angels and with the faithful in heaven and on earth who forever sing to the glory of your name. For the people of God, 
Let us together feast in our hearts with thanksgiving.